Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do mighty works in your name? I will then declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Well, we've talked about the chosen many times on this channel, and today we're going to do things a little different. We're going to look at clips and posts from the chosen and discuss how they compare to the Bible. And this is very important. I know a lot of people say it's no big deal. It's entertainment. It feels good. People tell us all the time that the chosen makes them feel closer to Jesus. We will see videos of people saying that today. People say it's actually made them understand the Bible. We're going to see clips and posts from people who say that today. People say they're in love with the actors on The Chosen. We'll see clips from people saying that today. So all the gamut of people's experiences with The Chosen will be addressed today. And my guest today is my brother in Christ, Shane Cox, who you may know from his YouTube channel. The link is in the description below. It's called Point Two, the number two, The Word. And he's also the administrator of a Facebook group that I'm going to encourage you to join. It is called The Chosen Be Not Deceived. And the link to that group is in the description below. I've been in the group for some time. I found it very edifying. Shane is someone who's actually, um, he's, he's mustering through watching The Chosen to find these salient clips for us. And uh, he I think he's even in some of the fan groups undercover to see what's being said about the movie. Oops, I just blow your cover, Shane. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, so cool. yeah. Th thank you, Shane, for joining me today to unpack what's going on with The Chosen. It's such an easy thing to watch. Like, it compl the Bible's complicated and sometimes hard to understand, but watching The Chosen has really broken down Jesus and truly who he is. So that's what we hear a lot from the fans, don't we, Shane, is that people say that the the show makes it easier for them to understand the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, one of the um, of our Facebook groups, one of the covers I had on there that The Chosen actually officially shared, um, they actually had one of the fans made uh, like a, a group um, of The Chosen, all the characters in there, and said, um, you know, I, I've, I've read the Bible, uh, but now I see it in color. Yeah. So, and, and for those who are not aware, why is that a problem? Um, so the Bible should be sufficient. I mean, it's God's inspired word. It's, you know, God breathed. It, it should be all we need. The Holy Spirit should be, you know, definitely um, revealing that to us. And that's it. We, you know, we, we don't need any, you know, addition. We don't need it's sufficient enough for us. Absolutely. Especially we don't need it changed, as we'll talk about tonight. Now, in that right. clip we just saw, the lady said that the Bible is complicated. Mm -hmm. And so she was looking for some kind of cliff note, <laughs> something simple. Right. Um, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I think that, you know, in a nutshell wraps it up. Yeah, well, definitely before I was saved, before God so graciously lifted the veil, as Second Corinthians talks about, the gospel was foolishness to me because I was perishing. So I, I absolutely agree with you, Shane, that that's the case. There's spiritual blindness. Mm -hmm. 100%. Okay, so here we have a meme from someone who says, I don't mean for this to sound disrespectful, but when I finally see Jesus I will be expecting him to look like, and he's, she says JR, but that means Jonathan Rumi, the actor who plays Jesus on this show. Here's a similar meme in which a fan says that in the past she would pray, envisioning that she would be speaking directly to God. But now she said that Jonathan Rumi, the actor in The Chosen who plays Jesus, his face comes into her prayers. That is just so sad. And this fan says that when she's reading the Bible, she sees Jonathan Rumi, the actor who plays Jesus on The Chosen. She sees that actor when she's reading the Bible, as well as the other cast members of The Chosen. 
And she even says that she sees some of the scenes from the TV shows, and those scenes aren't from the Bible, many of them. So this is really sad and alarming. And you see that a lot, don't you, with um, people who are watching The Chosen? I do. Um, uh, what I really get often is people, um, uh, for instance, uh, Levi Lusco and his wife had an interview with Dallas Jenkins, I think, a year or two ago, um, and she would say, um, how she said she didn't know the actor's name, which Dallas Jenkins later told her on you know, later. Um, but when she uh, prays, she sees Jonathan Rumi, and that's a very scary thing, um, but a very common thing that I see with Chosen fans. We have that clip right now. Let's go ahead and go to it. Well, I, I feel like my relationship with Jesus has mm. been so um, deepened. Um, by how you portray Jesus. I, when I'm having my quiet time and this, maybe this is weird, but I, sometimes I'm just picturing like having a conversation with him and, and the guy who plays Jesus, which I don't remember his name, like it just come, it always comes to my mind. And, and I'm a very just visual learner and I, I love pictures and I just like, and so you've just given me personally, but I know countless people just that visual of Jesus's kind eyes. And, um, yeah. and so I'm just so grateful. And my life has been changed by what the art and the creation that you have put out into the world. And so I'm just so grateful. Oh, that mean, yeah. So here's a, another lady who, when she closes her eyes, she sees Jonathan Rumi and she's expecting to see him when she goes to heaven. So this is startling. Absolutely. And uh, right at the end of uh, what uh, Levi's wife was saying there, uh, she said how her life has been changed by this. Chosen is basically changing how people are reading scripture. I'm sure you know my story. I was raised in Christian science, which taught a false Jesus. And, yeah. and, and I was not saved. I thought I was a Christian. I thought I was following Jesus. And then I got into the new age from Christian science. And it was even worse. The, the Jesus of the new age is He's like a hippie who says you can do whatever you want as long as you're positive and happy. And that's the progressive Christianity. I don't even want to call it Christianity. The progressive Jesus. Uh, he's, he's one who is a false Jesus. And we know from scripture that Jesus himself, here's some of the verses on the screen right here. He warned that there would be false Christ. The, all the characteristics of you know the Jonathan Rumi um, version of Jesus uh, which I've heard many fans even say, like, oh, I, I love this version of Jesus, or I love my Jesus of the chosen. You know, that's another Jesus. It's absolutely different characteristic. Yeah. So this, I mean, under the guise of entertainment, this could be someone's ticket to hell. I hate to sound dramatic, but it's real. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's why I appreciate you having me on. That's why I appreciate the platform you have and you covering this topic. Well, we have to. Um, I wouldn't want to see anyone go unwarned. Absolutely. So Dallas Jenkins, who's the writer and the director of The Chosen, is an interesting fellow. We'll be looking at some of the things he says today. Um, I would characterize him as double-minded uh, from what he says in a lot of these interviews. He, he seems to, I'm going to use the word pander to his financiers, the Mormons, um, and and then in the next breath, if he's caught, he says, oh, no, no, no. But we'll look at him kind of contradicting himself and we're praying for him. I mean, this yes. is not to condemn anybody. We're praying for him. OK, so here where it says, well, 30 pieces of silver was hard to turn down, um, speaking, yeah. of course, about Judas. Yes. And, and so they posted this where this fan is saying this program really betrays Jesus, the man and the savior. The yeah. chosen actually posted someone mm -hmm. who was calling them out yes yeah so like uh the, the there'll be um a person who doesn't really like um the chosen and so they'll say oh this pro you know program really betrays jesus the man and the savior and then the chosen up top will you know mock them basically and say well you know 30 pieces of silver was hard to turn down so that they're basically you know acting like judas right there like oh, okay. oh yeah well, yeah, that's this, this, that, yeah that one really grieved me how come every time I've watched Jesus projects and I love Jesus and I've read the Bible many times and I'm, 
I've studied scriptures all my life. Why don't I love Jesus as much when I watch when I watch him on screen? Like he seems boring. He seems like not very the like not, not the kind of guy who would engender uh, thousands of people to follow him around. Um, so the show is a bit of a response to that. So that's scary. So he's saying that the the gospels of the Bible are boring to him, and mm -hmm. people who say that generally. I find that, again, that's that spiritual blindness. I don't know if I would have called it boring before I was saved, but I certainly didn't understand it. And so I was always looking for something new and exciting. And, and so he's saying that he has to make Jesus more exciting in order to make him relevant, but he, he's contradicting what they just said, that it's the authentic Jesus. Yeah, correct. And yeah, the context of that, I think he was talking about like the, uh, the Mormons would do like a verse by verse. And so I think he said, you know, if, if I've seen it once, you know, I, I, there's nothing more I can really do for me. You know what I mean? And I, unless he has, you know, a crazy memory where, you know, he just, you know, receives all that so well, I, I, I personally need to go through the Bible a whole bunch. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like my, my son and I are in like first Samuel right now. And I'm, you know, picking up on stuff that I, you know, forgot about, you know, it's been a while since, you know, I've gone through it personally and it's exciting to me. I, I love that my kids asking questions and yeah, to me as a parent, that's exciting for me. Absolutely. Every time I read the same passage, I see something new mm -hmm. because the author the Holy Spirit, he, he will show you what's applicable at that moment or what you're ready to see. Yeah. I've read the whole Bible more times than I can count, and we'll, and I read it every day. I'm sure you do too. And I never would describe it as boring, would you? Absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe in my atheist years. Shane, this reminds me of Sarah Young, who is the writer of the Jesus Calling series, which we also don't recommend because it's extra biblical. It, it, it contradicts scripture and Jesus does not contradict himself where she said that the Bible was not enough and she wanted more. So she went outside the Bible and started automatic writing, which is a, a cultic tool I used to use uh, to channel spirits. And, and so this reminds me of Jesus calling and Sarah Young that Dallas Jenkins says he wants something more. Okay. This was something you brought to my attention, Shane, that Dallas mm -hmm. Jenkins said, people, people keep saying the transfiguration would be an important scene. And I'm confused as to why, what purpose would it serve our story? And that's shocking because the transfiguration is such a pivotal part of the gospel. Um, and it just, it's, you know, mo it's the law and the prophets and the disciples up there seeing Jesus in his glory. John even talked about that. So did Peter in their letters. So all I can think of is what you had sent me this, that Joseph Smith, who was the so-called Mormon prophet, taught that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John were also transfigured. What in the world? That's definitely Mormon you know, doctrine right there. Um, and then uh, the last, you know, what Dallas Jenkins said at the very end, um, my wife, a whole bunch of people, you know, when I, I post that, they're like, um, our story? You know what I mean? Like, don't you mean his story? And so that just popped out for a lot of people. You know what I mean? At the very oh, end, what yeah. purpose was our story? That's true. I didn't even notice that. Good catch on your wife's part. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's God's story of redemption. Yep. And his deity, you know what I mean? And yeah. so once again, leaving uh, you know, the deity out of the chosen, um, I, there's so many instances where they could have put you know, uh, the deity in there, but they really want to focus on humanity. They literally took out the baptism of Jesus, you know, quote unquote, um, of the chosen. So they didn't put John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. Correct. And why did they say that was? Um, so Daryl Eves, uh, who is the Mormon executive producer of The Chosen, said that um, there are so many uh, different variations of how different uh, faiths uh, would do that. And so um, 
basically in order to avoid that controversy, they just avoided it. Mormon theology on Jesus is different from Christian theology in a significant way, yeah. um, or at least official Mormon theology. What would you say to those who are concerned that perhaps Mormon theology on Christ might creep into the show? Now, in the show, uh, The Chosen, wouldn't you think that we'd actually show the, the baptism of Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't we show that? And once again, uh, the reason why is, here's the thing, is there's so many people that believe that the baptism was done in a certain way, right? And there's like theology on it. Yeah. Well, we avoided that. I think that's the reason why. They just want, you know, they don't want to offend anyone. You know, if they have the transfiguration and they see, you know, four people, you know, <laughs> being transfigured, oh. they're going to be like, what is, what is this, you know? Got it. Okay, so they don't want to offend the Mormons because they have a different view of the transfiguration and also of Jesus' baptism. Because when you look at the synoptic gospels, they all have the same story, basically, of right. Jesus his baptism. It was the start of his ministry. Maybe we should get going before they make a formal inquiry. Hmm? Jesus, please don't do that again. Huh? Yes, Abba. May I read? We'll see. Hmm? Come now. We've got a long journey. What are you going to do for your mother for this transgression, huh? So this is absolutely a different Jesus. And mm -hmm. our Lord and Savior is sinless. That's why he was qualified to take the punishment that we all deserve because we're all sinners. Uh, to say, have his father, Joseph, say that he transgressed is absolutely saying that Jesus sinned. What are you going to do for your mother for this transgression, huh? Uh, you know, human father, Joseph, in The Chosen, um it said this uh nowhere in the bible will, will you find that said uh which is the you know biggest thing there um you know they go out of their way the chosen do to include you know the word transgression it's it's in the script um uh, when i showed this to people on social media they were just shocked and um i would they're like, yeah, but it's probably not in the subtitles or anything. And I have the um, the chosen app on my phone, and and I went in there, you know, that certain uh, mark, and I you know took a screenshot, and you know, that, there you go. That uh, I, I you know I want to provide proof, you know, sources, anything you need, um, and then you know, balls in your court. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the things I appreciate about your Facebook group, Shane, is and your YouTube channel is that you provide sources. You don't gossip, you don't slander, you simply present and then compare to the Bible. And that's what we're commanded to do. Absolutely, and praise God for that. Amen. All right, what's next on here? Okay, so this is from Exposing the Chosen, which is another group that we appreciate. And so here's a meme from Dallas Jenkins, where he says, believe it or not, the first priority when making the chosen is not impacting lives or teaching people about Jesus or anything like that. Our first priority when making the chosen is to do everything we can to make it a good and watchable show, as if to make it a good show is the opposite of teaching about Jesus. Right. Yeah, I was absolutely shocked when I saw this one. And it's Dallas being Dallas just to create controversy. And, you know, basically, you know, um, any publicity is good, you know, publicity kind of thing. So uh, um, I, that's my viewpoint. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. Like it, it's just, it's insane how, you know, I, I can't even read this without just, you know, cringing, you know, believe it or yeah. not, the first priority when making the chosen isn't impacting lives or teaching people about Jesus or anything like that. He, it's as if he sees Jesus as a fictitious figure or something. It's like he doesn't know that Jesus is is the creator, is God, who came to earth as virgin born, fully God, fully man. It's as if he doesn't know Jesus. And there's so much you know, Mormonism, Catholicism in The Chosen. And so I, I don't know, I, him being an evangelical uh, professing, I, I don't I don't see how an evangelical could make this claim. It is. It boggles the mind. Only God knows what's in Dallas's heart. Only God knows if he's saved or not, but he is his fruit. All right, so let's go to this famous passage. 
How many sections are we up to? 19. Here's a little incomplete, huh? There is something about 20 that is more symmetrical. You could always shorten it to 18. Brevity is usually preferred. Which section stands out to you the most? Do not be anxious about your life, of course. Are there any sections that concern you? Give me your honest opinion. I know I don't have to say that, but... The whole truth. You know I won't be offended. It's... all... Well, very striking. But if I do the math in terms of good news, there's not a lot of good news. So this scene that you really brought to light because you've been so brave to watch this show, Shane, uh, is so offensive because it implies that God, the second person of our Holy Trinity, first of all, needs advice as to what to say and is insecure and that he needs to rehearse before he says something. As you know, there's been at least two famous interviewers who asked Dallas Jenkins about this scene and who is just acquiesced saying that it was possible that Jesus asked for advice and had to rehearse. And that just, the fact that people who are professing Christians would think that this is plausible, that upsets me just about as much as this scene. Right. Yeah, and plausible is the word. That's, you know, his go-to word. Um, and this scene is probably the one that uh, a lot of people in my group actually stopped watching The Chosen because of. This was so blatantly offensive to them that they're like, I'm done. I'm, I'm not watching anymore, and, and praise God for that. Praise God, yes. Um, there's another scene where Mary Magdalene, uh, the character, uh, basically you know, shows how she met uh, the character Jesus in The Chosen, and she said, you know, he put his hand on mine. Oh, and it's not what it sounds like. Maybe you shouldn't write that down. Just tell me about the first time you actually saw him. It was in a tavern. He set his hand on mine. Which isn't what it sounds like. Maybe leave that part out. People will get confused. I don't know yet what I'll be including. I'm just writing it all down. And it's like, what kind of mindset do you have with scripture? Like, how, how, is this really how you think it was, you know, just created? And all the new people watching The Chosen, you know, the billion that, you know, they're all reaching for, um, halfway there now, if they don't have any idea of how scripture was maybe they're going to think this is how it was formed they probably think oh you know just man did it and you know they wrote this down and you know if there's any objections by you know mary magdalene or matthew you know they probably just you know edited that out and that's that's insanity it's real insanity and also is insanity is that so there's a similar scene about your life what you'll eat what you'll drink about your body what you'll put on that is from your YouTube channel. And so here again, you see, as you pointed out, Jesus rehearsing again, rehearsing the Sermon on the Mount. And he, he's God. He spoke all of us in the world and every single thing into to creation through his word. Jesus is the living word. So it's yep. just, it makes absolutely zero sense that God would need to rehearse what he's going to say. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just really appreciate you going into the trenches, Shane. And uh, I don't know how you have stomached watching this, but I know you're doing it for the team. So thank you. Yeah, and uh, I'll praise the God. And also, uh, I guess this is a good you know time to share the story with you. Um, the first time when going through all this, like just watching all this, I actually went to bed and had the image of like Jonathan Rumi in my head, like, and I could not get it out. And I, it was crazy. And I, I prayed uh, to God to remove it if you would. And he, and he graciously and mercifully did. And it was just really, really strange that, that the occurrence happened. Hmm. If it helps, you know, people, you know, then, you know, praise God for that. Well, this is one of the reasons why God 
made the second commandment that we're not to have any graven images because of the false view of heavenly beings like Jesus. So um, mm-hmm. the, the, I have a video that I did with Dr. Scott Aniel of G3, who says that the chosen's main problem is that it violates the second commandment. And he said the same thing as you, Shane. He said that people will get it in their head that Jesus looks like Jonathan Rumi and Jonathan Rumi is a sinful man. We're all sinners. So that's not a good thing to do. The, if the Bible wanted to describe how Jesus looked, they would have gone into detail. But Absolutely. God did. that wasn't God's plan. For this, um, I, I try to have grace with people. Um, I, I know a lot of people, you know, are reading, you know, children's books, you know, and, you know, children's Bibles to kids. And I, I get it. It took me a lot of years. Yeah, absolutely. That's very kind of you. Okay, we're going to go to the next clip. This is a clip uh, that you found where Jesus is arrested, but it's not the arrest that is his time. So that is changing scripture in a very serious way. Jesus of Nazareth, you are sought for questioning by a Roman authority. Will you surrender to detainment peacefully? Yes. Jesus, no. Are you armed? I am not, but some of my followers are. Tell your followers to drop their weapons and step back 10 cubits. I will. May I say goodbye to my Ima? Mater mea. Yes. Don't be afraid, Emma. James and John, drop your weapons and step back ten cubits. is safe and doing well. He's back at the camp. You all look underfed. Filthy. We had a bit of a hungry spell, but we have men out on the water now stocking us up. He's used to eating well. What do you have to offer him? Should we talk about this later? Move out! All sorts of problems with this scene, right? So in, in throughout the Gospels, people tried to arrest Jesus, but he would always say, so she, well, in, in John 7.30, it was recorded. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And Jesus kept emphasizing that, that he couldn't be arrested until it was his hour, until it was God's plan. And so for this second arrest here, this is not only changing scripture, which is something that is condemned in the Bible, but it's changing Jesus as someone is vulnerable. In scripture, like Jesus will always slip away. You know what I mean? There's tons of that in the the Gospels and also when the actual the actual arrest happened in the bible um the only people that fell back were the soldiers like you see jesus you know character and chosen his uh disciples are the only ones that go back um in scripture the only ones that go back are you know the soldiers uh they fall over you know fall back and whatnot yeah it's just so wrong and then it seems like were they making the the centurion there it was he's supposed to be matthew levi's father they kind of uh, put that in there um, um so he's basically uh he worked with matthew um in the chosen so he um would be he knew matthew very well and he had a good relationship in you know the chosen and so that's why um the character jesus is like hey you know just so you know matthew's well you know et cetera, et cetera. okay well then they're adding to scripture there because there's nothing in the bible about that except for 95%. levi I know. Yeah. Levi had (laughs) tax collectors for dinner. That was about it. Okay. Let's go to the next. 
anything with my Where would you like to start? This is our you. Lord our God. King of the universe. Let that save those big titles for the devil. <laughs> so Jesus never refused worship. He did tell people, don't reveal who I am until mm-hmm. he was ready. Uh, but he always accepted that people acknowledged that he was Lord and Savior. Yep, absolutely. And this actually reminds me of like the clip we had before this, uh, where you know he uh, the centurion's like, "What do you have to offer him?" Uh, Matthew is talking. That would have been a you know a softball you know, to you know to have you know the gospel or just something in there. You know what I mean? So and now this um, Jesus refer, you know refusing worship again. Um, and we're going to go through another scene as well where this happens. And I, is this Mormonism in play where yeah. Jesus, you know I mean, it's, it's deity. Absolutely. Mormon and new age, because in the new age, we saw Jesus as it's so blasphemous, but we saw him as just a good teacher, just a good man and a role model for us. So Jesus, if you do not renounce your words. We will have no choice but to follow the law of Moses. I am the law of Moses. So this was something that was quite controversial. In fact, um, this was something that the Chosen posted because, as as you said, they like controversy because controversy, it's like a uh, J who was that the Barnum Bailey circus said that it sells, it makes. Yep. Uh, and so look at that. They even wrote mic drop. I am the law of Moses. So they knew that would upset the evangelicals and that they would share it. And I guess they get more publicity. So let's talk about why this is an issue for Jesus to say, I am the law of Moses. So uh, first of all, our friend Drew Gosnell wrote a little blog about this. And he said he can't find that I'm the law of Moses in the Bible, but it is in the Book of Mormon. And this is the mic drop moment of the new season three trailer for The Chosen. Jesus says to the Pharisee, I am the law of Moses. Jesus is not the law. The law reveals the righteous standard of the holy God. It reveals our own depravity. It points us to Christ, but it is not Christ itself. Jesus came to fulfill the law by obeying it perfectly on our behalf. Jesus had several I am statements, all of tremendous importance, but he never once said, I am the law of Moses. But in the Book of Mormon, you'll find the LDS version of Jesus saying it, behold, I am the law and the light. Look unto me and endure. I don't even want to say this because this is blasphemous. But uh, Drew says, maybe this wasn't intentional on the part of the chosen team, but it's a problem when your portrayal of Jesus says things not found in scripture, but rather in the Book of Mormon. Again, when Dallas Jenkins says, get used to different, our reply should be, let's not get used to a different Jesus. And thank you, Drew, for that uh, astute observation. So then Dallas Jenkins, just as you said, he's very sarcastic. He rolled with this. So he he said um, in this this post, he said, I, I want to troll the internet with Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus, and release a clip saying, please renounce your words. They're from the Book of Mormon. And he wants Jan- Jonathan Rumi as Jesus to say, I am the Book of Mormon. And then he quips, too soon? Ha 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 ha. No, that's not funny at all. That is. We want to pray for Dallas. You know, I mean, it's very important, um, you know. And this is just crazy. Um, my family and I actually went on a trip to uh, Kentucky uh, a few weeks back, and we went to the Creation Museum and um, the uh, Ark Encounter. At the Creation Museum, they had a list of all the I am's that Jesus biblically said, um, and I am the law of Moses, not one of them. Also in uh, Third Nephi, um, where they're actually quoting us from in the Book of Mormon, uh, they have a heading um, just before they even uh, go through the verses. So they have a heading of chapter 15, and it says, Jesus announces that the law of Moses is fulfilled in him. But if you back up to 3 Nephi 15, 2 from the Book of Mormon, uh, it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had said these words, he perceived that there were some among uh, them who marveled. 
and wondered that he would uh, or, uh, and wondered what he would concerning the law of Moses. So the whole context is law of Moses. So then when you read seven verses down to 3 Nephi 15, 9, you know, it'll say, behold, I'm the law, the law of what? The law of Moses. So um, concerning that this is so popular. It's Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He fulfilled the law. One of the reasons that people are attracted to these type of false teachings and they just want entertainment they want to feel good they want to crush on jesus you know think of him as their boyfriend instead of our lord and savior who created us uh, all of these surveys are, are very concerning and th these are recent surveys. this one's from 2017 but we even have more recent that say that um Catholics and Protestants today are religiously more similar than they are different. And of course, Jonathan Rumi is Catholic, as we'll see. And we'll see why that matters, because he's using his fame to point people to Catholicism and Catholic apps. So look at this, the number of Protestants who basically are universalists and ecumenicalists um, by saying that they're the same. And, and if you're not familiar with the differences, we're going to point that out to you. Okay, so in the percentage of U.S. Protestants who believe that both good deeds and faith in God are needed to get into heaven, the majority say that. When Protestantism was built on the Reformation, in which Martin Luther said that it's, he pointed to the Book of Romans that says that it's, it's not our works, it's God's grace. It's, we're saved by God's grace, not by our works. And look at, so the majority of Protestants, as well as the majority of Catholics, believe that works get us into heaven. So that's de definitely concerning that we have this blending here. This shows that people are not reading their Bible. And Ligonier, who's done some really good research, they do the State of American Theology Study. And here's the methodology, in case you're wondering. 3,000 people, uh, balanced, representing uh, different age groups, different uh, genders, income, ethnicity, region, and also religion. So this was not just professing Christians, trying to make a snapshot of Americans. So here's from Ligonier. Um, U.S. adults increasingly reject the divine authorship of the Bible, relegating it to the same category as other religious writing. As we look at two, 2022, an uh, increasing number of people do not see the Bible as authoritative, as sufficient, as God's uh, inerrant word. So they're downplaying the Bible. So it kind of makes sense that they would be okay with an unbiblical portrayal of Jesus when you look at these surveys. Yeah, that's, that's so staggering. And that's really sad. I and mean, um, and I'm sure, you know, that little portion, you know, I'm sure the chosen, uh, you was in that little blip somewhere. Yeah. Well, here's the, the ecumenicalism, the, the uh, universalism is the belief that all people go to heaven, all religions are talking to the same God. That's what I believed before I was saved. And Jesus, of course, he, he teaches, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to heaven except through me. And it makes sense because he created heaven. It's, it's his place. He can have whoever he wants in there. And he's the only one who's got the empty tomb. The rest of these um, so-called religious leaders are dead in the ground. He's the only one who took, took the punishment that we all deserve. So Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But look at the number of people here, Shane, who believe God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, and the, this dark teal on the right is how many people that's the majority the majority of people according to the survey believe that is true take a look at how it's increased over the years since 2016 it looks like it decreased in 2020 maybe during the pandemic people were reading the bible i don't know but it's increased in 2022 god accepts the worship of all religions it's really sad and here's here in 2022 as a reveals a significant increase in evangelicals who deny Jesus's divinity. This makes me want to cry. Such a belief is contrary to scripture, which affirms from beginning to end that Jesus is indeed God. They believe now 
that Jesus was a great teacher, but not God. That's what I used to believe. And so this is why they're not offended by the chosen, apparently. And now this is, to me, what the whole issue is, is people don't read their Bible. Nearly four in 10 Americans say they never read the Bible outside of church services or mass. And how many Americans actually go to church? Um, and if they go to mass, they're reading a different Bible. So an another two in 10 say they read it on their own no more than twice a year. And look at how many people in this chart that's on the screen say they never read the Bible. 40%, the majority never read the Bible. And only 10% 10, 10 read it every day. Well, that's that's insane. Um, and, and yeah, if you look at daily and never, that's half the population. You know what I mean? So, and mass... Um, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, in Catholicism, you know, they want to just rely on, you know, the priest, you know, the whole church for their salvation. And, and that's, you know, never reading the Bible. It's like a, another, you know, version of the Dark Age, you know, the Dark Age is all yeah. over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it used to be, as you said, on purpose. And, and people like William Tyndale went to, were burned at the stake for trying to bring the Bible into modern language. And it's such an honor that we have the Bible and people are not reading it. And this is from 2021. So this is a recent survey. This is just really sad. So let's go back to a clip. Um, and and this is Dallas Jenkins at the K-Love. K-Love makes me cringe. I don't know about you. It has Thanks. mostly Bethel elevation and Hillsong music um, pretending to be Christian. I mean, they might have- yeah, they might have the occasional biblical theological songs, but most of it is pop psychology songs. Um, so here they are at the K Love Fan Awards. There's Dallas Jenkins, the writer and the creator of The Chosen, with two of the actors on either side. And and look at what he says about himself in this, or what he's implying. It's so offensive, you guys. Yeah. They play James and John. They're trying to get on my right and left hand. Okay, so for those who are not familiar with the Bible, since we just saw the statistics, most people do not read the Bible. I'm assuming people who watch this channel do. Um, Jesus is on the right hand of our Father God. And James and John, were t their mother was trying to get them to sit in an elevated place and glorify them. And Jesus said, well, do they want to drink the cup of suffering that I'm going to drink? And and such. So, and, and he said, of course, the, the lesser shall be greater and the greater shall be lesser in heaven. A lot of lessons about that. And here's Dallas Jenkins. Um, I'm going to say it puffed up. And uh, who thinks this way? Who, who alludes that he's like, not only like Jesus, but like our father God, who would have someone on the left and on the right? Yeah, when I, when I heard this and saw this for the first time, I'm like, what? what? Uh, -uh no, not no. Nah. Like, it, 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 sadly, it keeps he keeps like progressing worse and worse and worse as the seasons of the chosen go by, and so I'm like, I, I mind blown, and it's right there. I mean, for the biblically literate who see this, um, and you know, just automatically, you know, scripture pops in their head. This is incredibly sad. Very and puffed sad. up. But that's yeah, puffed up is exactly pride, exactly. Yeah, it's really sad. Well, let's keep going. After that post that was posted, you actually, you're so brave, Shane. You went in and you um you asked them in the live chat what was going on here and what did they reply to you? They said, check out your Bible for more on that smiley face. So that's really cavalier yes um and this uh this live stream took place um uh, during the whole uh, pride flag uh situation fiasco so in this clip um dan Hazeltine and matthew nelson are the composers of the music of the chosen and so they're talking about uh their impressions too of the chosen versus the bible i mean i think I think it's hard to find somebody who doesn't know Christ at all. Um, but I think they know a version of religion or a version of faith. Um, I think the stories we tell about Jesus are not very compelling. Um, yeah. and, and so 
I think when they see this version of Jesus portrayed, I think it really does. It, it matters that he's merciful, that he's, he's extending a lot of grace. Um, he has his own flaws in a human way. Like he's very relatable and, um, and gracious. And I think people need to see that, mm -hmm. that side of Jesus. Cause we've, a lot of us have been force fed um, you know, a, a version of Jesus that only cares about our behaviors. I've grown up all my life knowing these stories and somehow watching The Chosen is um, almost like I've never, I've never heard this story before. Mm -hmm. and the way the characters are portrayed, Matthew um, being portrayed as on the spectrum in some way. And um, there's just all this beautiful creativity that mm -hmm. doesn't take, um, it's, it doesn't matter whether or not it's whether or not it's factually accurate that Matthew was on the spectrum or not, or whatever. It's plausible. But seeing Matthew portrayed that way is, um, has brought so much beauty into um, so many people who responded to um, Matthew's character in particular, right. but a lot of the others as well. So it doesn't matter if it's factual or not? Um, yeah, it doesn't, you know, it's not factually accurate or, or whatever. Um, and then how many times do they say the version of Jesus? You know what I mean? And so you know, we talked about that earlier, how, oh, they'll have a version of Jesus. You know, how many Jesuses are there? Um, and then um, they said, you know, Jesus had flaws. Um, and that kind of, you know, with the transgression that you showed earlier um, of, you know, Joseph character playing, uh, you know, basically saying that, you know, Jesus transgressed, you know, this guy thinks that, you know, Jesus has flaws. And also he says, you know, the stories aren't very compelling. And uh, I don't, I, I don't know many different, you know, definitions of words and stuff. So I'm like looking that up as, you know, I'm watching this, you know, compelling means, you know, evoking interest or attention or admiration, you know, so it's not interesting. They obviously don't understand the gospel that Jesus is the sinless lamb of God. If he had flaws, he would not have been qualified to take the sin punishments that we all deserved. He would not have yep. been qualified to take the wrath of God. For them to downplay that and say Jesus is not relatable because he doesn't have flaws is so flippant. And it just shows a spiritual blindness that, again, only God knows their heart, but it's really shocking. And and I know they are not on the show and they're not the writer of the show, but they're creating the music. And, and so they have an influence. In fact, um, one of the things that uh, you found, and I appreciate you kind of going into these fan groups, is that the fans, uh, the female fans are reacting lustfully to the actors on the show. We talked about the second commandment violation, but this is something else. This is the sin of lust. And look at this, these reactions they're having to the actors, uh, including the one who plays Jesus. And it's, it makes me cringe. It's just, it's really sad. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I do want to point out like, I'm happy that we covered a lot of this stuff, you know, at first, you know, just because if, if I had like one argument and was saying, oh, you know, look at the Chosen fans, you know, that doesn't really speak to the Chosen itself. So I'm happy we went yeah. through all that, you know, material right. first. It's lustful and that's kind of, that's what they go for. And the per, uh, character who plays Peter and the character who plays Jesus are usually the two that you'll see um, these women, uh, you know, lust after and be outspoken about oh, it's really the, the sad first, the first one like it was the most outrageous one i think yeah well yeah that's just that's not how we would describe our lord and savior no. oh. and it's so but important it's just... to be in prayer for these fans you know what i mean like i i and, and that's the whole uh, you know this is why we're doing this you know uh you know to please our father and also to warn others that hey you know this is out there and you know please you know be in prayer for these fans for you know dallas the actors you know everyone mm -hmm. well it shows one of the reasons why people are attracted to the show is that they're attracted to the actors and and i remember uh, a woman i knew who was very much into Jesus Calling, she had the same reaction because Jesus Calling also portrays Jesus as a boyfriend. 
And she would tell me that as she would drive to work every day, she would imagine Jesus sitting in the passenger seat and they would hold hands uh, as they were like a boyfriend on um, going on a date. It's just, it's when you don't read the Bible, when you don't understand the context of who Jesus is, it's easy to make up these things. God is gracious that, you know, he can save people out of this stuff. You know, and so there, there is hope. And, you know, because a lot of people, like a lot of the fans will, you know, argue back, like saying, well, this is bringing so many people to Jesus, you know, kind of like your, in, you know, our intro. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are reading the Bible now, like, aren't you happy about that? And that's kind of the argumentation you'll hear. Um, and, you know, we'll get called names, uh, you know, heresy hunters or, you know, hateful, you know, I'm sure you experienced that as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, Romans, you know, 8, 28, like, you know, and we know all things work together for good for them that love God, to them, you know, who are called according to his purpose. And, you know, the law is what these people need. Um, you know, Galatians 3, 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, uh, that we might be justified by faith. I do believe that, you know, some chosen fans either are saved or, you know, they will become saved, but I would not recommend the chosen at all. Uh, you, of course, you have liberty to watch it. Um, you know, I, I don't want to tell anyone that they, you know, they can't watch it, but you, you have liberty, but I would absolutely not recommend it. Absolutely. Yeah. No, this is something that uh, is not edifying. In fact, so Matthew Battershell here is, he's like you, he's very brave to post. And he's saying Christ did not redeem us so that we would backslide back into the flesh, kind of like those comments that we saw the women lusting after the actors. And Dallas Jenkins replied, I honestly think that you have a psychological issue that keeps you from understanding what others say. And so that's, that's mean. That's not uh, speaking truth and love at all. It's not truth or love. That's very harsh. Um, yeah, and speaking the truth in love is absolutely what we need to do. Um, that's kind of, you know, in our Facebook group, I always, uh, and other members too, we we put Bible verses up and, you know, we just want to, you know, encourage each other and, um, yeah, just to walk in the spirit, uh, not in the flesh. And, you know, this is some of the stuff, you know, you'll see, um, you know, Dallas acting this way, the fans acting that way, uh, in, you know, in general, um, there are exceptions, you know, I'm not going to, you know, blank, make a blanket statement and say all, you know, fans are like that, but, yeah. um, and I'm sure, you know, we have more, uh, you know, uh, screenshots of, you know, what Dallas Jenkins says later on too. And it's just Dallas being, you know, Dallas being Dallas rather. Mm hmm well, let's um, let's go to this next shot where uh, Jonathan Rumi, who's a professing Catholic, Roman Catholic, he's on a uh, Catholic, the Cath I think it was called the Catholic Weekly podcast. And the interviewer asked him, why did Jonathan Rumi think that audiences warmed up to him portraying Jesus? So let's hear what he said about that. I think it's because um, Jesus has felt relatable. Yeah. Jesus is feels human for mm. the first time and in, in, in many in most any iteration uh, that one can remember um, we've never gotten to explore Christ's humanity um, I mean so Jesus the real Jesus fully God and fully man both here and when he came to earth in his earthly ministry. So uh, definitely Jesus portrayed his humanity. He, he was hungry. He was tired. He was thirsty. Uh, we saw his humanity on the cross when he was obviously in pain during the crucifixion. Um, but what they want to seem to make Jesus more relatable is having human flaws or human sin. Is that what they're meaning? Uh, one of the verses that a lot of um, them will pull up, John 21, 25, um, it says, and there are also many other things which Jesus uh, did, the which if they uh, should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself cannot contain the books that should be written. Amen. And so they take that verse. A lot of the chosen fans will take that verse and then they'll be like, well, you know, not, they got a lot to work with. You know what I mean? And so, the 95% uh, that isn't from, you know, uh, scripture, they can basically fit in that one verse. Um, one fan even told me recently, well, what, you don't believe that 
Uh, Peter uh, took a poop in the woods, uh, and I never thought I'd say that sentence before in my life, but you know what I mean? That, that's where they go to. Well, there's a reason why things are in the Bible and not in the Bible, and that's us trusting that all scripture is God breathed. 100%. Right. Which then puts me in a dangerous spot when I'm making a show about Jesus mm -hmm. where 95% of the content isn't from the Bible. So there, are, there is a group of people who won't watch the show because they don't believe that they're, they'll use terms like you shouldn't add to the Bible. Well, because you shouldn't add to the Bible. Scripture says that we shouldn't add to the Bible. So, I mean, it would take probably a half hour to say all the scripture that says yeah, sure. don't ask. Yeah. But let's just start with Revelation 22, 18 through 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Uh, Proverbs 30, verses 5 through 6, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Yep, so, absolutely. So in this clip, uh, Dallas Jenkins admitted that he said 95% of the show is not biblical. And I know Melissa, I mean, we worked together for years, and you can see from her facial expression, she was not happy to hear that, that, um, that it's not biblical. And, you know, again, as you said, Dallas Jenkins being Dallas Jenkins, where he's basically justifying what he's doing, because it's entertaining. And it, it's not like that dusty, old, boring Bible that he's, as he's seen the Bible. Yep. And it's kind of like that double speak, you know, double minded that you talked about earlier. Um, you know, authentic Jesus, you know, one part of his mouth says that, and where uh, this other part, you know, will say, oh, but, you know, 95% isn't from scripture, you know, directly from scripture. And, you know, get used to different. They do say that, don't they? That's their tagline, isn't it? It's on a sweatshirt. <laughs> That's right. He's wearing that on his sweatshirt. So, what does he, what does that mean? What's the context for him when he says get used to different? His whole thing where when he started The Chosen, uh, when he had like the pilot uh, for it, it was basically from the perspective, uh, you know, where it's not focusing on Jesus. So like uh, the character of Jesus um, in the first season, first episode, um, it's almost like he's playing, you know, like a cameo or, you know, like a, a side role kind of thing. And so um, he, the character of Jesus in the first season, episode one, didn't really come around till later on. So it's, you know, the chosen. So it's, you know, through the eyes of the disciples. Really and I guess it's not verse by verse either. So I guess that'd be different too. It's, it's really concerning. Uh, and Dallas Jenkins, very ambitious. He's trying to reach a quarter of the 8 billion people on the planet with his show, which is really scary because he's saying get used to different. So he's ushering in uh, kind of an antichrist. Yep. A lot of people say that in the group and yeah, it's definitely antichrist. It's, it's different character. It's totally different. And, you know, I, I don't hear him saying too much, you know, in interviews, you know, what the gospel is and, you know, kind of like, um, you know, exposing the chosen uh, that uh, the screenshot you had earlier you know, he's not interested in that. He's interested in the show. Well, in fact, the show, our show, you know what I mean? This is deeply concerning. Does the Jesus on The Chosen ever talk about repenting? Does anyone talk about repenting? Um, there's been a couple of times um, uh, and very little. Um, you won't see that very much. Um, yeah, it's just all humanity, uh, just relating to Jesus. You know, he had his flaws. And so he's, you know, just like us. Um, yeah, I think maybe twice I've uh, seen uh, repentance. Um, there might be more, but um, it's it's very little. Uh, you'll you'll see words like you know beautiful and loving and you know uh, you follow your heart kind of stuff. You'll you'll see all that. Very new age, very concerning. Why do you always go off to these desolate places? Okay, so right. that's that's John the Baptist, apparently, and he's he was beheaded because he confronted Herod about his illicit marriage. 
Um, so, so that part, you know, has some basis in scripture, the Elijah-ness, that has some basis in scripture. But as you said, um, this is where he says he has followers. Uh, John the Baptist was very humble from my understanding. Yeah, same here. I mean, we all think of the verse, you know, um, I must decrease, you know, you must increase. You know what I mean? I, I don't, I can't really catch that verse in here at all. No. Yeah, I mean, I can understand, okay, that's his cousin. Maybe there's a familiarity there. And I just don't like how he's questioning Jesus going off right. into the wilderness like that. I mean, yeah, there, you, you could say there's parallels when he was in prison and he was asking, are you are you the one? Uh, he asked yes. his, his devotees or his, I guess they were followers to go ask Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, yep. But but there's an element of disrespect here that's that really bothers me. Yep, and you're not alone. Uh, I saw that too. Um, and a lot of people, I actually put a poll up um, on our uh, Facebook group in order to see, hey, you know, what, what 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 scene really got to you? Like, what made you stop watching, or you know, really affected you? And you know, the the whole um, you know Jesus character basically you know not receiving worship, um, you know, on the mount uh, rehearsing that was those were big ones. Um, and, and this one too, uh, the way that John the Baptist is portrayed is you know like you said disrespectful, and that was one of the things that made a few people stop that I'm aware of. And, you know, I'm sure many, many more. Good. They should stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. Praise God. <laughs> In this clip, we see more disrespect toward Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Here we see a portrayal of Peter yelling at Jesus. Why are you upset? Why are you chasing after Gentiles when your own people have problems right here? When your own person has problems? I've been right here in front of you, believing in you, but you're breaking up fights in the Decapolis? So I, this really offends me. This is Dallas Jenkins twisting, behold, I am doing a new thing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he just, he seems like he just doesn't even care that he's twisting scripture. Yep. And uh, yeah, and this is the cavalier attitude, as you call it. You know, I mean, just absolutely uh you know pride uh that, and we really you know i really pray for him um that he won't fall you know i i and i actually maybe that would be you know a good thing it, um if he did you know uh you know basically god would grant him repentance and uh he would be humble uh you know as it reminds me of you know in luke you know, basically how, you know, Jesus taught there's, you know, two people in the temple, you know, one was praying, you know, I, I, I'm i so happy I'm not like this, you know, other, you know, publican that, you know, is by me, you know, I do all these things, you know, I tithe, I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the publican, you know, didn't even want to raise his eyes to heaven. He just said, you know, be merciful unto me, a, a sinner. And I don't see this attitude with Dallas Jenkins at all. No, uh, it seems like, as you said, pridefulness and and kind of re and rebelliousness too, because when he says it's still plain, uh, he's obviously talking to his detractors. That and he's yeah. a lot of people think that if they wor have worldly success, that God has blessed them and that it's working. And they don't understand Psalm seventy three says that God sometimes lets wicked people have success as part of their judgment. That certainly was me before I was saved. I was very successful on a worldly basis. Um, and it was God allowing me, kind of giving me over like Romans 1 to my sin. Right. And uh, just the accountability, too. Um, I don't know. Like, I, like me, I'm, I'm a nobody. Like, I, 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 I had people uh, warning me the other you know, day. Like, there's two people who are like, hey, you know, you should probably kind of lay off the, you know, exposing so much, you know, kind of get closer, you know, to God, just, you know, just focus on God a little bit more. And yeah, I mean, like, I, I personally, I was humbled by that. And I, 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 you know, took, you know, a great appreciation that they were, you know, message me like that. Um, and I, I really wish that, you know, Dallas Jenkins had that same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope he's got people around him who tell him the biblical truth. Yeah. But a lot of times people who are successful just have 
you know, sycophants, yes men around them. True. So we're going to talk about the pride flag that was on the chosen set. And Dallas Jenkins has said that this was a pride flag from one of the cameramen. You can actually see that the flag was on a piece of equipment here. Does that make this okay? And so this became a um, something that a lot of people were talking about. And Dallas Jenkins himself came on to discuss it. And what he said in this clip we're going to see is of concern because he's he says that there's absolutely no criteria for people who work on The Chosen at all. So let's take a look at that. I mean, we're a show about Christ, uh, so we're probably one of the most Christian content uh, in history uh, because we are about Christ, who's in the word Christian. But the production itself, the, the equipment, the, the crew, the team, the set, I mean, we film all over the place on different sets and we have uh, we work with different vendors and uh, we don't have any kind of corporate policy about statements of faith or uh, anything like that. Uh, we don't have corporate prayer uh, on our set, um, but uh, and, and we have all kinds of employees. There's no statement of faith they're required to sign, like I just said. Uh, there's no offset clauses like, you know, off the set, this is how you have to behave or anything like that. Just it, it's just important for you to remember that uh, we are a for profit public company. Uh, as of now. And because of that, um, we might run things a little differently than you would. And we certainly run things differently than a church or nonprofit or ministry. Dallas Jenkins insists that he and the chosen are not a ministry, but look at him on the cover of Outreach, which is a small church ministry magazine. And he is pretty proud of it, as you can see from this post. We'll also see how the LDS Church uses the Chosen for kind of a Bible study in their church. So we can also see from the fans, as we've been discussing, that they see the Chosen as a form of ministry that's affecting their Bible study and their prayers. Now, this next clip of Love is Love, which is something that I used to say before I was saved, because I actually believed that, and I didn't understand the biblical definition of marriage. I was very ca cavalier about marriage, and uh, and now I see that it's God's creation order, and that he's done this to preserve the family that the devil's trying to disrupt. And so there seems like with this clip that there's a woke agenda that's woven into this uh, this scene right here. Let's go take a look. Understand, but love comes from marriage. Jews, Gentiles, love is love. So you wrote, um, don't the writers know what this phrase means? I'm sure they do. For sure. Um, and for clarification, like this scene, you didn't really talk about homosexuality at all. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize love is love. Um, you know, this happened in season three. It was, you know, 2023. I'm, I'm sure everyone, you know, who doesn't live in a cave knows the phrase love is love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just, it's just kind of part of a pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then, you know what I mean? Like then the pride flag came out, um, on that, uh, you know, behind the scenes kind of video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this rainbow colored pride flag on the set of The Chosen, uh, The Chosen defended the presence of the flag on their official Twitter account that uh, different beliefs of cast and crew is just what we do. And so this this is just something that is a heads up. This is not this is not biblical. You would not see a pride flag in the Bible. So in this next clip, um, this is a man who's portraying the character of Nicodemus, and this one really upsets me because this speaks to the New Age beliefs and practices that are portrayed on the the Chosen, where Jesus himself asks Nicodemus, "What does your heart say?" And Jesus never would even hint to following your heart at all. Uh, and this would be something that would be unbiblical, as Jeremiah 17.9 says that the heart is deceitful. Uh, the verse is here on the screen, as you can see. So let's take a look at this clip right here. Is this is the kingdom of God really coming? 
does your heart tell you? My heart is swollen with fear and wonder. You can tell me nothing except that I am standing on holy ground. <laughs> holy roof and Okay, just a list of things that bother me here. Uh, one is the new age music, and we saw the musicians, what their attitude is. Um, it, it bothers me that the man who plays Nicodemus seems like a really good actor, and yep. it's a beautifully portrayed scene. A lot of people tell me they watch The Chosen just because it's visually very stimulating. If they just did the regular story of, that's out of the Bible of Nicodemus, it would have been amazing. It would have been jaw dropping, stunning. They, they don't need to twist it to entertain us. It was in the script. Uh, you know, another thing is, I looked at the script. Uh, you know, I was in shock when I saw this. I'm like, no way. Maybe it said something else. It's in the script. You know, you don't have to do that. What are you doing? And then later on in the scene, uh, the character of Jesus actually like lifts him up. You know what I mean? And so. It just, it, those two words or phrases that, you know, you don't have to do that. What are you doing? And then, he, you know, Jesus lifts him up. You know, you don't got to be on the ground. You can, you know, we can see eye to eye humanity. Right. Yeah. That level playing ground that you can relate to. But this is, Jesus is God and he deserves our awe, our reverence, our worship. We need to praise him. And in the Bible, which is the real Jesus, he accepted worship. He never once told people, what are you doing? In fact, he, I mean, he's God. He knows what everyone's doing. He knows the secrets of your heart. He knows your intentions. So this scene just makes no sense. And it's such a waste. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, uh, the actor plays Nicodemus, like you said, he's been in a, in a ton of movies and like films and yeah, he's very gifted. Uh, you know, God has given him a you know great gift uh, for you know acting and doing what he does. It could have been an awesome thing had they stuck you know to you know scripture instead of the script. Yeah, I agree. So speaking a new age, like follow your heart. Uh, this is from Dallas Jenkins, who is quoting Richard Rohr, which I shouldn't even be shocked at this point, what Dallas Jenkins says, but it makes sense because Richard Rohr, I have a video that Marsha Montenegro, who wrote a book about Richard Rohr uh, called Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret, uh, I interviewed. I'm going to put a link to that video in the description below, but Richard Rohr is one of the progressive and new age teachers who talks about the Christ consciousness, the universal Christ, and the feel-good Jesus. So it makes sense if Dallas Jenkins is following Richard Rohr, who's, by the way, one of Oprah's buddies. Oh. And who? let's play a clip here. I'm going to put this clip in of Oprah and uh, Richard Rohr talking about the different Jesus. Matter and spirit are operating as one. Now, see, that's no competitive religion. That no. That's an inclusive, all-inclusive all religion. All-inclusive religion. That's not the Jesus most people know. Well, it isn't what I was given either. So no. we're, all, we're all victims of this. I just think the first 2,000 years of Christianity weren't ready for the momentous nature of what we say we believe. So do you think that the mind of the people are ready for this vision of a universal Christ in now? If Dallas Jenkins is reading Richard Rohr and recommending this different Jesus that Richard Rohr teaches about. It's a new age Jesus, false Jesus. Then that explains a lot as to why he's comfortable portraying Jesus in this way. Okay, so now this is a blog by Matthew Nelson and Dan Hasseltine, the musicians for new. I was going to say for New Age, for The Chosen. We just saw that clip with Nicodemus. That trance-like music, it puts you into a trance. It makes you more open to, I think, to demonic uh, messages. And, and you kind of lose awareness of your surroundings. And it's very, 
people think it's calming. I used to think it's calming. Now I think it's jarring. And so they are also talking about Richard Rohr and they're kind of saying it tongue in cheek, my favorite heretic. So they know he's a heretic. Uh, and, and they're quoting him saying, biblical tradition is saying that the absolute, uh, the only absolute available to us is the faithful love of God and not any concept or st structure, even our religious traditions themselves. God's love itself is the center and the still point of the turning world. But if we have never actually experienced this love, we will most assuredly look for absolutes. That is so upsetting. It, what they're saying here is that anyone who says that God has absolutes and the Bible has absolutes, they have not experienced God's love. I mean, that reminds me of what some of the hyper charismatics say. They say that if you're in a biblically solid church, it's a spiritually dead church. Really, really sad. Uh, and here again, this is very Richard Rohr. The musicians of The Chosen are saying that, um, that we need to get back to the ecumenical attitude Jesus had at the very beginning. Jesus never was ecumenical. He was the one who told the Pharisees that they were a brood of vipers and that their father was the devil. He never accepted heretics or those who thought differently. He, he, of course, ate with the sinners, the prostitutes and the tax collectors, but it was because he was telling them to repent and sin no more. It wasn't because he was ecumenical, which means accepting all paths. I mean, Jesus came to bring salvation, and it was only through him. Yep, 100%. And yeah, like Jonathan Rumi. Um, he'll talk about, you know, ecumenism and just you know, promoting that. Um, he's on the Halo app um, and the Chosen actually as a whole, um, uh, not just Jonathan Rumi, but as a whole, the Chosen uh, partner with the Halo app, which is the number one Catholic app. Um, and they uh, partnered with them uh, last year. Yes, they did. We'll get into that. We'll show a clip of that because that's uh, kind of speaks to all this. So here again, the musicians are sharing a Richard Rohr quote that what is unique about Jesus is his inclusivity itself. Where in the gospel is he inclusive? I want to see the chapter in the verse. Mm -hmm. I don't see inclusivity in the, in the gospels. Do you? No, quite the opposite. You know, I'll come to bring us, you know, a sword or, you know, division, you know, mm -hmm. it's there, there is unity. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's biblical unity. That's right. Yeah. It's really scary. Um, and then Katie, who's apparently one of the musician's wives, wrote a book that it, that's kind of espousing the Enneagram, which Richard Rohr, he's a big proponent of the Enneagram. He's one of the people who marketed it as a so-called Christian um, tool when it's not. The Enneagram is based on automatic writing and the occult. The Enneagram was made by a man who was a, an occultist. And we've got lots of videos on that. In fact, I'll put a link in, in the description below for any of you who don't, who are not aware of the Enneagram's occultic uh, basis. And so Dallas Jenkins apparently uh, promoted her book, Do Not Buy This Book. This is not biblical. This is just us showing that the wife of the... Um, musicians is a proponent of the Enneagram. Again, not Christian, even though Richard Rohr says it is, it's absolutely not. And she talks about something called the, how to pray the Eximen, not biblical. And something that uh, sounds like the mysticism you'd see in Lectio Divina, Catholic traditions that are mystical. A, a member from our group, I actually sent her all this stuff. She had a, a big New Age background too, and she just spotted this stuff because you know, I mean, that, that's my blind spot. I, you know, I'm I'm so grateful for our members in our group. They're very, you know, absolutely helpful. And we're, you know, we're a team there. It's not just you know one person or it's we're a team. So this next clip is Dallas Jenkins on a Mormon podcast talking about how he believes that Protestants worship the same Jesus as Mormons. And we're going to do a side-by-side -side comparison coming up for those who are not familiar with the differences. Um, if you're not saved, you think that all Christians are alike. If you say Jesus, it's the same Jesus. It's not. Um, the Mormon is outside the Orthodox faith. They don't believe the Orthodox gospel that we believe. So let's take a look at this uh, where 
Dallas Jenkins says that we worship the same Jesus. And then when he's caught, he denies he says that, but it's here on record. So this is something that uh, the double-mindedness we've talked about. Beautiful things about this project have been my growing brother and sisterhood with people of the LDS community that I never would have known otherwise and learning so much about um, about your your faith tradition um, and realizing, gosh, for all the stuff that maybe we don't see eye to eye on, that all happened, that's all based on stuff that happened after Jesus was here. Um, the stories of Jesus we do agree on and we we love the same Jesus. Notice how Dallas Jenkins says he has a growing brother and sisterhood with the LDS community. By saying that the Mormons are our brothers and sisters, he's referring to them as Christians. We only have brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he goes on to say to David Snell, the LDS interviewer, that we love the same Jesus. The stories of Jesus we do agree on, and we, we love the same Jesus. Um, that's not something that you often hear. Sometimes it's like, oh, you, uh, they that's believe in a different yeah, Jesus than we do. Statement. Yeah. No, it's the same. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll sink or swim on that statement, and, I, and it's controversial, and I, um, I don't mind getting criticized at all for the show, and I don't mind being called a blasphemer. I don't like it when my friends are, and um, I've made it very clear that um, if, I go down, if I go down, I'm going down swinging, protecting my friends and my, my brothers and sisters. And so I don't deny we have a lot of theological differences, but we, we love the same Jesus. Let's just start with the, the, the central question. Is it true that I said, um, which is what you've seen in some headlines or seen in some, some, uh, some titles of videos, Dallas Jenkins says, quote, and then it'll say Mormons or LDS, whatever term that they want to use. Mormons and evangelicals love the same Jesus, or LDS are Christians. Is it true that I said that? And the answer is no, um, I did not. Uh, I'll just say, yeah, it's been, it's been quite a ride. I, and it, it all came out of my conversation with you. I said that you, um, that, that many LDS folks and I uh, love the same Jesus. Uh, I still believe that. Um, it's gotten me in a lot of trouble, but I still believe that and I'm not, I have a bit of a superpower in that I don't really care if, <laughs> if, if, if something that I say that I passionately believe is, is uh, criticized. Yeah, that's not a superpower. No, that's him trying to please everybody. It's the heart and heart. You can't um, do that. I, yeah, I, I guess one thing I would bring up um, is the you know Mormon gospel is uh, found in 2 Nephi 25, uh, 23. Um, and it's for we labor diligently to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For all we know, that is by grace that we are saved. Now, that sounds all good until they uh, cap the next part on after all we can do. So workspace gospel, false gospel, it different is. Jesus, different characteristics. It, it is. Um, so we we know and here's. A screenshot to show that the chosen is produced by Latter-day Saints. In fact, two Latter-day Saint bishops so high up are the executive producers of the chosen. And that actually LDS Living, look at if you look at this, um, says we can use clips from the chosen in their kind of Sunday school and their gospel learning. Uh, to teach and help bring the New Testament to life. So uh, the Mormon church is loving this show. Yep. And in the interview earlier, you know, you heard Dallas Jenkins say to uh, the interviewer, you know, uh, David Snell, that, you know, uh, we agree on the stories of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it, what comes after that we kind of disagree on. Well, you know, we covered the transfiguration. Like, we no, it's not true. We don't agree on that. Absolutely. Now, this is kind of detailed. We don't have time to go through all of this, but I'm going to put um, these on the screen and people can take screenshots and study these. The, the difference is that biblical Christianity is founded, um, is based on Jesus Christ, where Mormonism is based on a false prophet, Joseph Smith. 
And we know he's a false prophet because he prophesied things that did not come true. And Deuteronomy is very clear that if anyone says a prophecy that does not come true, it is they are not from God. Correct. So uh, the Mormonism and, and Protestantism are not the same. Uh, we do not consider Mormons to be Christians. They use a lot of the same vocabulary, but they are not um, the same. Here's another one that we can see just kind of some of the differences. Uh, Mormonism believes that, um, that Jesus was created, a man who became God, where the Bible is very clear that Jesus is the eternal, the, the co-eternal, the second member of the Holy Trinity. He's always been there. Uh, he was not a created being. So just big differences, as you can see on the screen, between the Book of Mormon LDS teachings and what our Bible teaches us. And so here's Dallas Jenkins again trying to be cute, but he's being blasphemous. He says, the most common question is, what did Jesus whisper to Lazarus? And he jokes, I'm about to quote the Book of Mormon. And, and then he says, and this is just so offensive, he says that he thinks it'd be funny for uh, Jesus on the cross to look down and wink at Joseph Smith walking by. A great troll, he says, and that's the second time we've seen that language. You know, uh, it'd be a great troll. Just, it's not funny at all. It's it's something that he needs to repent. Yeah, and th this is Dallas Jenkins humor. Like, it, we will see it, um, you know, all day long on here. Like, it, he thinks this stuff is funny. Um, and, he, you know, like I said earlier, it's it's two things, sarcasm and, you know, mocking. That, that's the mocking, character you'll yeah. Dallas Jenkins. Yeah, and we've been told in the Bible that in the last days there'll be scoffers, and he's he is he's a scoffer, isn't he? Yeah, good point. I stand by it, and it's and I and I and I love the scene. I did not know at the time <laughs> that that like when the guys at VidAngel and LDS were like, "Hey, man, well done on that one scene. That's like an LDS commercial." And I was like, "Oh man, please don't say that publicly because it's gonna." It's going to kill me. It could cause some people to think that new revelation can come and we don't believe in new revelation. So I didn't know at the time that it was going to be so um, appreciated by the LDS <laughs> community. I'm not concerned about how people uh, will interpret it rightly or wrongly. And if it makes certain faith traditions really happy, that's great. <laughs> An LDS commercial. Yeah. Honestly, and yeah, yeah. Well, what else can you say? Um, mm -hmm. He's concerned about faith traditions, and he kind of, you know, says his, you know, superpower. Um, again, you know, I don't really care what people have to say. Dallas Jenkins says, the notion that Mormons believe in a completely different Jesus is foreign to me. I have a hard time believing that, but maybe that's part of the issue. I mean, here, this is so, you know, you can see the difference is exposing the chosen good Facebook page. Uh, yeah. Does it a comparison here? Big difference between the Mormon Jesus and the real Jesus. And exposing the chosen says that the, the partner and distributor of the chosen knows the difference between Mormonism and Christianity Dallas Jenkins claims to have spent hours in conversations and prayer with the Mormons he's working with, yet he says that some Mormons are true believers. And Jenkins has never said what needs to be said. Mormonism is a cult. Having come out of a cult, Christian science, that would have offended me in the past. This will offend Mormons now. But you know what? Sometimes being offended is one of the things God can use to convict people. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of that verse where Jesus says, you know, you fall on a, a stone, you know, you'll be, you know, basically crushed. And you know, that's the humility you need. That's right. Yeah. Speaking of other religions, um, Jonathan Rumi, as we've mentioned, is a Roman Catholic. And he and part of Roman Catholicism is the belief that you have to pray through saints to talk to God. And specifically, they pray through Mary, uh, who she's we revere mary i mean she's blessed of all women yes she yep. was the earthly mother the virgin mother of our lord jesus christ so we have complete respect for her but she was a human she was not divine 
She was used by God, but she's not divine. So as a human, she died. And the Bible tells us we cannot talk to dead people. That would be necromancy or mediumship. And that's a condemned sin. So talking to dead people, including Mother Mary, as much as we revere her, is it, it doesn't work, first of all. She can't hear you. And secondly, right. uh, it, it is not how we talk to God. The temple to curtain tour when Jesus was on the cross, signifying that we now have direct access to God. The book of Hebrews explains this beautifully. So we don't need to do what he's doing in the scene. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I used to be very much into Marianology. I traveled to Lourdes in France, lit candles everywhere we went. I would go into Catholic cathedrals and and would go to the statues of Mary and pray to her and ask her for intercession. This is not biblical. Speaking of intercession, uh, 1 Timothy 2.5. Uh, for there's one God, one meter between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And also, uh, you keep hearing the same prayer over and over and over. That's repetition. You know, and Jesus biblically warned about that in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. You know, when you pray, you don't need to heap up empty phrases, you know, as the Gentiles do, or, you know, vain repetition. You know, you don't need to do that. That's right. And so people might say, well, that, what's the big deal about Jonathan Rumi being a Roman Catholic? I mean, he's, that's his personal life. Well, the big deal is that he is using his fame on The Chosen to get people to download this app that he's a part of called the Hallow app, which is the number one Catholic prayer app out there. And yeah. so at Christmas time in 2022, the Advent, uh, he, Jonathan Rumi was doing prayers, as, as you'll hear in this one, and the prayers were Hello, to Mary. and welcome to Pray 25. This Advent, we're so excited to prayerfully journey together with Mary. Advent is a beautiful season in which we prepare to invite Jesus into our hearts and homes at Christmas. And who better to lead us through this season than the woman who was there at the start of it all? Mary has a unique role in salvation history, foreshadowed in the Old Testament and brought to fulfillment in the New. Her vocation to bring Christ to the world is a vocation that we all share in, and one we seek to grow in during the Advent season. During the first three weeks of Advent, we'll explore three themes of Advent, hope, faith, and joy. We'll lean on Scripture to help us understand and grow in these virtues, and on Mary as we ask for her help in opening our hearts to Jesus. We don't lean on Mary or any people, no matter how blessed she was uh, to be the virgin mother of our Lord and Savior. Um, there's nowhere in scripture where we're commanded to talk through Mary or any of the Roman Catholic saints. Yeah, I'm so happy that you put, you know, Mary in a good perspective. You know, some people kind of go on, you know, either ditch and like, um, you know, basically say, oh, you know, Mary, you know, that's, you know, Catholics believe that, you know, that, and I don't know, it's so weird that people do that, but to have a, you know, a, a great, you know, idea of who Mary was biblically is so important. And to put that in a you know, proper context of, yeah, she you know, God chose her. She is, you know, uh, very valuable. God's will was done through her. That's right. But she's now uh, in heaven Correct. with her son, and we're not to pray to her so, mm -hmm. or to have statues of her as a graven image. So here, this not only is Jonathan Rumi a Roman Catholic, uh, he's also a Knights Templar. My husband, he loves Knights. And so he didn't know the difference. He said, oh, here's a knight with a cross. So he actually had the costume and he had it on a, on a, a, a knight, an armor, a knight armor statue that he had in our house. And then when he found out what it was about, he, you know, we threw the whole thing away. In this clip, uh, Jonathan Rumi talks about his knighthood, his knight templar, which is something that is... I think it's related to Freemasonry and and cults and also definitely New Age. Let's take a look. If I can bring it up here. That was the ad. I'm wearing a mantle 
and a cross with a little crown on it. That is called um, a knight's cross. Uh, five years ago, I was uh, knighted by the order, the uh, solemn uh, sovereign military order of the Temple of Jerusalem. I lost my mind there for a second. Um, essentially, the Knights Templar, which is what that is, are a an ecumenical charitable organization. They're officially an NGO, a non-governmental organization recognized by the United Nations that do charitable work for, uh, especially uh, in on behalf of Christians uh, and many persecuted Christians around the world. Um, I have a heart for persecuted Christians as well. Um, being especially from the Middle East. It is very tough to be Christian in the Middle East. I know a lot of people close to me that were persecuted growing up in the Middle East because they were Christian. Um, and so the Knights Templar uh, are a phenomenal organization that um, do good works they, uh, on behalf of those people and on behalf of refugees and they do missions, they fly aid over to uh, all parts of the world, obviously with COVID that has been suspended, but they um, are a phenomenal organization, uh, many uh, military based and backed and, and, um, and oriented uh, uh, folks, men and women, dames and knights uh, combined that make up this uh, tremendous voluntary charity, non-governmental you know, organization that essentially helps people. So, um, and they asked me to, to join their ranks uh, a few years ago. Um, in addition, in the last year or so, um, some of you who were at the Young Catholic Professionals Conference, which I spoke at at the end of April, um, may have heard that I also had been honored to begin the process of being inducted as a papal Knight, which is basically a, an order of knighthood recognized by the Pope himself. Um, yeah, so um, that will be cool if that, you know, when that actually commences into the knighthood. So again, uh, there's a lot of evidence that the Knights Templar uh, is a uh, is related to Freemasonry. And as we know, Freemasons is a lot of it's being exposed now that kind of the people on the bottom don't know much about it, but when you get to the elites in the Freemason, there's a lot of satanic rituals and uh, things that are immoral, illegal sins. So we have to just be, they have, it just shows to me a lack of discernment. So in this next scene, um, Jonathan Rumi, the actor, is talking about preparing for his role of Lonnie Frisbee in the movie, The Jesus Revolution. And you might think, well, that has nothing to do with The Chosen, but it, again, speaks to the character of the actor. And again, we've seen that he's trying to get people to follow him on the hollowed app. And so, you know, people think that Jonathan Rumi is Jesus. We've already established the fans are crazy for him. Mm -hmm. So he could influence yeah. people. And in this clip, he's talking about, again, praying to the dead. In this case, he was praying to... Lonnie Frisbee, who was one of the founders of Calvary Chapel, who's dead, and how Jonathan Rumi went to Lonnie Frisbee's grave and did something that's similar to what Bethel Redding does, the grave soaking, and it's it's and was looking for signs and omens, which is also condemned in the Bible. Um, also, I'd like to point out to uh, the chosen fans as well. Um, so they'll actually. They go see films and of other uh, actors, actresses, uh, or in other movies. So a couple of examples um, in the chosen, like pro, uh, like Facebook uh, pro chosen fans uh, group, uh, mouthful. Uh, but they would see, you know, hey, Jonathan Rumi is going to be in this movie. You know, let's all go see it, kind of thing. And then I think the most recent one uh, was Indiana Jones a movie. There was uh, an actor that was in there. So they're like, oh, let's all go see this movie. So yeah, you, you know, you got your fans, you know, going to see this. So uh, yeah, they have a lot of influence in other films. It, it makes sense. I mean, we saw how ravenous the, <laughs> the fans are about the different actors. They've got crushes on them. So yes. just like following a rock star. 
So let's take a look at this clip where Jonathan Rumi is talking about his necromancy, his mediumship, which is something that is a sin that no one should be doing. So, um, before I started work, I went over to Christ Cathedral and uh, I, I sat by his grave and I prayed a rosary with him. Oh, I didn't realize he's buried there too. He's, oh yeah, he's buried there, yeah. Oh, well, I'm gonna have to go take a look at that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's powerful. In fact, I sat down and I prayed with him. Um, the, the, the space just to his right is empty. So I got to sit down or lie. At one point I even lied down because I just thought it would be kind of interesting to try to connect in some way. That's probably more information than you need or may even want to publish. But that said, uh, I, you know, I, it's the, the truth. And so I finished praying with him. And I said, Lonnie, I want to honor you with this film. And I really want to, um, to, to, to bring justice and, and, you know, the testament to the gifts of God's grace and, and powers that you, you know, displayed while you were on this earth. And so if this is a good idea that I do this film, have somebody give me a sign, give me a sign, have God give me a sign. Mm -hmm. And the minute the words left my mouth, behind me, there was a door open to the cathedral and this giant cord rang out for about five seconds. And then from the organ, from the organ. Wow. I hadn't heard it before. And that's the very organ that used to be there when it was the Chris, it's the same organ that when really? it was the crystal cathedral, mm -hmm. it was sent out and refurbished and whatnot, but it's the same one. So I heard that and I was like, okay, thanks for that. <laughs> There's just so much wrong here. I mean, going yeah. to talk to a dead person and ask him to help with an acting role and then to look for a sign from a, a church that was run by a heretic, Robert Schuller. Uh, I mean, let's count the ways that this is just completely off the rails. It's so grievous. And uh, as I was watching this with you, I, I, the verse popped up in my head. Uh, from Matthew, you know, 16, 4, you know, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. You know what I mean? Like, no, it says no sign shall be given, you know, to accept the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed. You know what I mean? So, like, that's all you need. You, you don't need to seek after signs at all. Not at all. I, but this is, it just speaks to the character. And those of you who are crushing on Jonathan Rumi, be careful, because he also is um, going to see Padre Pio, who was, he's a Roman Catholic saint, of course, but in the New Age, Padre Pio was someone that a lot of New Agers would go to travel to because he was said to increase your psychic abilities and, and to heal. I mean, there was a lot of people who said they got healed by his. It's said that if you go see the relics of Padre Pio, you get uh, a healing. And a lot of people say that because he was, supposedly the first priest on record to have the stigmata, which is people who say that they have the piercing in their hands like Jesus had on the cross. So it's just really mysticism. The 10 commandments to Catholic in Catholicism are changed from the Bible, from our holy uh, canonical Bible. And what they have eliminated is the second commandment against graven images. And that's why the Catholic church is filled with statues of Mary oh, yeah. and the different saints. I used to love going to Catholic cathedrals and seeing those statues before I realized why God does not want us to pray to them. But that's what the Roman Catholics do. Here's a chart kind of similar to what we did comparing Mormonism to Protestantism, uh, comparing uh, Protestantism to Catholicism. Uh, they have the same vocabulary, but very different understandings of the gospel. Uh, there's a reason why our cross that we have in Protestantism is empty because Jesus has ascended and the Catholic cross still has the deceased Jesus on the cross, um, just because different way that they view um, Jesus. Yeah, the they definitely are just chock full of, um, you know, different, you know, symbols, uh, just, you know, graven images. Um, again, you might think, well, what's the big deal if the actor is Roman Catholic? Well, the big deal is that, as you said, Shane, because you are paying close attention to what these fans do, 
that people could be lured into Roman Catholicism. And again, I get letters all the time from Roman Catholics who say, well, Peter was the first Pope because yep. they go to the verse about on this rock, I shall build my church. But it doesn't, doesn't say that Peter was the Pope at all. And, yep. and Roman actually Catholic- on an episode, I, I, I apologize for interrupting, but uh, season one, episode four is actually called that on the chosen. Uh, the, uh, the rock on which uh, it was built is actually the title for the episode. Mm-hmm. And um, the whole episode revolved around uh, Peter, uh, the actor in there. Uh, it absolutely revolved all around. And, you know, you, if you guys, you know, the fans here, uh, you, you check your chosen app. You know what I mean? It's season one, episode four, um, the rock on which it is built. There's a chosen app? Yep. So um, there's a chosen app you can download, watch all three seasons of The Chosen, uh, as I've done. Um, and literally, season one, episode four, The Rock on Which It Is Built. That's, yeah. that's what it's called. And I, w- I would guess maybe 70% of the entire episode is all just on uh, Simon Peter. Mm. Well, he was a very important disciple, and he yep. definitely, his letters bless us till, still to this day. Yeah, 100%. Uh, um, yeah, I, I just want to, you know, relay again, um, I, I we are praying for, you know, Dallas Jenkins actors, you know, fans included in here. Um, we have sourced uh, everything in here, and we just want to make sure that you guys, you know, will see this. Uh, we've included so much scripture. Um, we genuinely care about you guys. Um, you know, this isn't us heresy hunting, you know, we're not trying to bash you. We're not trying to be hateful. We're trying to speak the truth in love. And that's our 100% our goal. We want to please our you know, Father in heaven. And we want we are you know, desperately trying to um, get you guys to understand. Um, and Dallas Jenkins, that goes for you too. I, I love you. I, I, I really pray um, that you would see these things and repent. Amen. May God open everyone's eyes and and give them a hunger for God's word. The Bible is the most exciting book I've ever read. It has the answers I've always looked for. And so please don't dismiss the Bible as being boring. Uh, please get in the word every single day and you will be enriched beyond measure. Amen. Thank you so much, Shane, for being with me today and uh, really breaking this down. Again, please join us at the Facebook group. The link is in the description below. Thank you so much, Dorian.